Thank you for tuning into Oxygen presentation today. We are a biotechnology company developing transformative therapies for blindness diseases and a COVID vaccine to save lives, starting with our breakthrough modified gene therapy platform, which we believe is uh, not only a breakthrough, but also unique and a game changer in ophthalmology space. One product has potential to treat many inherited retinal diseases. Findings were published in the Nature. RQ400, the first product in the pipeline in the gene therapy based on the AAV and R2E3, has four orphan drug designations from the FDA. Once again, um, you know, we're planning to um, treat uh, retinitis pigmentosa, broad disease, with this product. Retinitis pigmentosa has 150 mutations. Therefore, it's uh, almost not practical to develop 150 products with the traditional gene therapy. We believe our one product has potential to treat this large disease. Once again, uh, we're planning to initiate our early stage clinical trials, two parallel phase one twos so in the second half of this year. The next product in the gene therapy pipeline, OQ410, based on the AAV, Aurora gene, it has potential to treat dry age-related macular degeneration, significant unmet medical need globally. And this is going through preclinical. We're planning to initiate phase one, two trials in next year. We also have a strong strategic manufacturing partnership with Consino Bio. Uh, it's a large biotech company. And uh, because of the partnership on the manufacturing side, it's really paving the way uh, in a rapid, uh, very efficiently to move our program to the clinic this year. Now coming on to our RQ200, a novel biologic, which is targeted for major retinal diseases, um, where there is a significant underserved population because current therapies such as anti-OGF therapies, there are many uh, patients who are non-responders, about 50%. So we're trying to target uh, diabetic macular edema, diabetic retinopathy, and with ac macular degeneration using this product. Coming to our vaccine, Covaxin, which is uh, targeted for COVID-19, um, it's a whole virus inactivated vaccine with an adjuvant. It's being co-developed with Bharat Biotech. Currently, Bharat Biotech has received EUA in India, um, emergency use authorization, and uh, they have initiated mass immunizations using this product. The salient features include, it's a standard storage condition for vaccines, which is two to eight degrees, and uh, easy for supply chain. And a promising safety and immunogenicity data has been generated through phase one and phase two clinical trials. Currently, the phase three clinical trials, the enrollment has been completed with uh, about 26,000 patients. And the differentiation feature with this vaccine, since it's a whole virus vaccine inactivated, it has got multiple protein antigens, uh, which could be beneficial um, not only for the broader population in lieu of any viral escape through mutations in the future. Now I'm going to go into more details a little later in the presentation. Now coming to our management team, we have a very experienced management team with a proven track record of success in developing, launching, and managing life cycle of many biopharmaceuticals successfully. Coming down to our scientific advisory boards, starting with the Retina Scientific Advisory Board, highly credible group with significant expertise in gene therapy clinical development. Now coming to our Vaccine Scientific Advisory Board consists of uh, several top academic uh, professionals from UPenn and also industry experts from uh, X, Y, and Pfizer vaccines. Now coming to um, our pipeline, starting with the modified gene therapy platform, RQ400 again, as I mentioned before, we have four orphan drug designations targeting NR2E3, row mutation, CEP290, and PDE6B. And uh, if you consider the prevalence rates for these uh, all together, it's about 20% of retinitis pigmentosa, which is about 100,000 patients in the US, 1.5 million patients globally struggling with the many mutations, this is a debilitating disease. Many of these patients go legally blind um, by the time they're in mid forties. And they're desperate and looking for therapies to rescue from the blindness. 
And this program is moving rapidly. It's progressing well. We're planning to initiate our phase one, two trials in the second half of this year. Coming to our second program in the gene therapy, OQ410, which is targeted for dry age-related macular degeneration. About nine to 10 million patients struggle with this disease in the US alone. It's a significant unmet medical need. Globally, there are no therapeutics approved to treat uh, dry AMD. Again, uh, we're in the preclinical stage. We're planning to move this program to clinic next year. Coming down to our OQ200, which is a fusion protein, transferrin, tomstatin, targeting DME, DR, and wet age-related macular degeneration, about uh, 9 to 10 million patients in the U.S. alone. There is a significant uh, underserved population, as I mentioned before, because there are a significant number of non-responders to current therapeutics in the marketplace. So therefore, we are going to initiate um, the clinical trial starting with the DME, diabetic macular edema, next year with this program. It's moving well through the preclinical stage right now. Coming down to our vaccine, as I mentioned before, it has received um, emergency use authorization in India, and, uh, and also they started uh, mass immunizations using this product. Um, and the phase three is still ongoing. They have completed the enrollment. Currently, um, with our scientific advisory board and a significant number of advisors uh, who are helping Arcogen, we are putting the plans together uh, for the US EUA and, uh, uh, and also US commercialization. Now I'm going to go through each of the programs in more detail, starting with Covaxin. And Covaxin has a large database. They have evaluated uh, uh, this vaccine in about 1,000 subjects in phase one and phase two clinical trials. And the phase three clinical trial uh, enrollment has been completed about 26,000 patients. Again, um, the data is available online from the phase one and phase two. Very significant uh, um, um, immune responses to, again, a spike protein, receptor binding domain, as well as a nucleocapsid protein uh, with strong cellular responses, which is really necessary for um, long-term durability and memory. And uh, again, this vaccine can elicit response to multiple antigens. That's a differentiation factor compared to other vaccines, which focus on the spike protein. So if there's a significant change uh, with the viral escape and mutations in the future, since you have multiple antigen coverage, uh, this could be effective. And it's a purified vaccine based on the VeroCell platform. And again, uh, this, this platform has been tested very well. In fact, uh, they produce uh, polio vaccine for babies using similar technology and platform. So it's very safe for all um, age groups. Again, uh, we have established a very, very strong scientific advisory board consists of academic and industry experts who have significant vaccine expertise. And uh, currently, we're putting the clinical and regulatory path to bring this product to US so that uh, you know, we'll be able to quickly deploy and save lives. Um, you know, we really want, we are committed to fight against COVID. And our goal is to you know, extremely work hard this year and to bring this product much needed product on the US toolkit to the market. Now I'm going to um, go through our modified gene therapy program. Starting with, uh, once again, uh, there is a traditional approach uh, on the left side of this slide and uh, our modified gene therapy demonstration on the right side. With the traditional gene therapy, um, you have one product in the marketplace in the eye space, um, um, Luxerna. It's targeted for RP65, single mutation. And so you have a defective gene. So you give a functioning gene through AV vector. Once you start expressing, you control the disease progression. However, if you want to take that approach and develop a product for another mutation, and you have to start from scratch and do the preclinical studies, go through phase one, phase two, phase three, and uh, apply for BLA and get the approval, this whole process will take eight to 10 years. So if you have a disease such as retinitis pigmentosa, as I mentioned before, there are about 150 mutations that only represent 60% of the population. Remaining 40% is random. It's a difficult to genotype. So if you take this traditional approach, one has to develop about at least 150 products, which is almost not practical. And as I mentioned before, many of these patients do become legally blind 
by the time they are in mid forties. They're desperate and they're looking for therapies sooner than later. So without gene therapy, modified gene therapy platform, if you look on the right side, you have a defective gene and you give a modifier gene which controls many gene networks within the retina who are responsible for um, cell development to survival. And uh, they upregulate many genes under those networks and bring homeostasis to the retina and restore normal cell function. Therefore, each of these products can be potentially used to treat many, many um, inherited retinal diseases with a single product. Once again, um, we do have four orphan drug designations, uh, as I've shown on the slide, nr 3 rhodopsin CYP290, PDE6B, and also the broad spectrum potential for RP treatment. And uh, this could be very beneficial for patients, and uh, it'll be very cost efficient because one product can go after many diseases, so you don't have to repeat you know, a lot of the work. And coming to this slide, again on the right side, um, um, I mentioned about you know the gene networks, looking at uh, photoreceptor development, inflammation, phototransduction, and uh, metabolism and cell development. Again, these are the three genes um, which we identified: NR2E3, NR1D1, and RORA. These are like master genes in the retina. They control these gene networks responsible for cell development to survival. And uh, again, uh, they regulate. This modified gene therapy concept is not new, and it's well known in other diseases areas such as cystic fibrosis and uh, spinal muscular atrophy. However, Oxygen is the first company to bring this concept into the ophthalmology space, which could be very beneficial for the patients. Uh, last year, uh, with our collaborator at Harvard Medical School, we published this uh, um, uh, the data uh, demonstrating why uh, this gene therapy can be used for broad spectrum RP. Again, uh, this publication goes into five different unique animal models um, in the advanced stage of this disease as well as the early stage of the disease. And looking at multiple endpoints, including functional endpoint and safety, demonstrating the therapy is effective in significant rescue of blindness um, from early as well as the late stage of the disease, as well as it's safe. And in multiple animal models, which represent, you know, uh, multiple human uh, disease phenotypes. I'm going to walk through the high-level data from this publication. Now, coming to this slide, um, here, again, uh, we have early and advanced stage of the disease, five different animal models, focus on the bottom of the slide, looking at the fundus imaging, untreated, versus single treatment of AV vector nr 2 3 gene. And so if you look at that, on the top of the fundus imaging, you see RD1, rho, RD16, and RD7. Those are animal models. Above that, um, there is a human phenotype disease. Enhanced Escone syndrome represents RD7. So untreated animals have a significant spotting in the fundus. That means showing, demonstrating. The retina is significantly degenerating. And at the bottom, you see a significant clearance of the spotting, showing there's a significant rescue across the board in all five animal models consistently, showing the treatment single subretinal injection of the gene therapy is very effective. On the top again, you're looking at, on the left side, early stage, and on the right side, advanced stage of the disease. In both the cases, um, you're looking at outer nuclear layers. In the untreated animals, on the right side in the advanced stage, you don't find any outer nuclear layers. And uh, in the treatment, you know, you have significant rescue. Similarly, in the early stage, very, very low levels of autonuclear layers are present in the untreated, and the treated, treated animals, there's significant presence. Again, demonstrating the, from histology from autonuclear layer and fundus imaging, the therapy is effective across the board in multiple animal models representing multiple human diseases. Now, coming to functional endpoint, which is uh, electroretinogram looking into scotopic in the you know dim light like night conditions and the photopic which is a well lit conditions again looking at uh, four different animal models rd1 to rd16 consistently showing the therapy has rescued you know there's a significant rescue um, based on the erg um, amplitude here 
Now we have demonstrated in multiple animal models the therapy is effective. So one would ask, are there any off-target effects? To demonstrate that, we've taken healthy animals and uh, again treated them with an R2E3 gene, which is RQ400, and looked at the fundus imaging. Histology on the left side, you'll see those retinal layers. Um, and then uh, looking at the ops in uh, immunochemistry models. And on the right side, which is a functional endpoint, ERG signals. And across the board, um, the data looks normal compared to uh, untreated animals. Again, demonstrating not only the therapy is effective across multiple animal models, which has potential to treat many, many retinal diseases with a single product, and the therapy is safe. Coming to our clinical and regulatory strategy. Um, as I mentioned before, we are planning to initiate two parallel phase one two trials this year with nr 2 e 3 mutation as well as rhodopsin. Once again, it's the same product, RQ400. You manufacture, we are done, we're doing currently GLP talk studies. We're scaling up the manufacturing for GMP, uh, 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 GMP scale uh, at a commercial scale to take it to the clinic. And so once this is done, it's the same product, so we don't have to repeat. We would like to get you know, a data in phase one, two, safety as well as efficacy signal. Then one of the efficacy signals will be picked up as a primary endpoint, then we'll move on to phase three. So we want to do phase three clinical studies in uh, multiple um, uh, disease um, populations. So once we have that uh, efficacy and safety, and uh, we'd like to get a approval for the broad RP indication with uh, potential some phase four commitments. So now in this one, um, you know, we're trying to compare competitive landscape with other therapies available in the ophthalmology space, including you know, traditional gene therapy as well as cell therapy. Once again, uh, we have a therapy which can be very broad uh, for broad many, many um, inherited retinal disease populations, but a traditional gene therapy, as I mentioned before, you have to go one product or one mutation at a time. And uh, once again, the Cell therapies are just coming there in the clinic. It's not a proven technology, no approved product. However, they could be a little broader than traditional gene therapy. Uh, however, there are multiple cell types like photoreceptors, RPE cells. So at least, you know, with the cell therapy, you can at least cover the cell type if it's effective. Uh, one of the salient features of our gene therapy program, as I mentioned before, it has ability to bring homeostasis to the retina, which is very important. I mean, that can have a significant impact uh, not only on significant rescue, but also for long-term potential durability. Again, since one product targets many, many diseases, you have significant economies of scale. And now um, coming to our second program in the gene therapy, OCU410, which is based on AAV Aura gene. Dry AMD is a unmet medical need, significant unmet medical need. Nine to 10 million patients in the US alone and millions and millions of patients globally struggle from this. And uh, the reason is it's a very complex disease. Multiple factors contribute to that. And uh, there is inflammatory issues, oxidative stress, and lipid metabolism. And uh, experts in the field believe if there's a way you can tackle all of them at once, it may be effective. Therefore, we have another gene such as RORA, which is RQ410, um, um, another master gene. And uh, it uh, has potential to control all these networks responsible for this. Therefore, uh, we believe we have a potential target for dry AMD through RQ410. We are working extremely hard um, in the preclinical stage this year on this program, and uh, we are hopeful to take it to the clinic um, to you know, uh, dry AMD patients next year. So I mentioned about our strategic partnership with Consino Bio, uh, which is uh, a win-win partnership and which is really uh, contributing and helping us to move our gene therapy into the clinic in a rapid pace because of the partnership. Um, Consinobi is a large uh, biotech company with the state-of-the-art facilities and world-class team. Many of the founders and uh, you know, senior management team worked in large pharma in the US and, uh, uh, and Canada. There are Americans and Canadians who founded this company and they have very large facilities and, uh, and uh, commercial scale manufacturing with a proven track record of success. And they even have a, a GMP cell lines, HEK 293, they use. I mean, they are also on the COVID-19 uh, you know, vaccine development on the forefront, and they use the similar manufacturing trains, which really supports us. 
Currently, they have successfully scaled up the manufacturing process at a commercial scale at 200 liter to move this into the clinic uh, this year. Once again, uh, this is a very lucrative partnership for us because uh, typically the gene therapy programs, single product capital costs range from 25 to 35 million from taking it from phase uh, preclinical all the way to phase three and filing BLA. And with this partnership, Consino actually absorbs all the costs and to provide the CMC and manufacturing for us. And in return, they get uh, low single digit royalties from our markets. And they also have greater China uh, market rights. And uh, when they sell the product, we get uh, you know high single digit royalties from them. So this partnership is really very strong. Uh, it's really helping us to move this program very well into the clinic. Now I'm going to spend a few minutes on our biological program before I close out. Again, AQ200, um, is targeted for many retinal diseases in the back of the eye, diabetic macular edema, diabetic retinopathy, and wet age-related macular degeneration. It's a fusion protein. Tumstatin uh, binds to uh, integrin receptor on the active endothelial or cancer cells and it triggers a native antigenic process, and uh, it could be very effective in treating this. And transferrin uh, is attached to that genetically, so this one is uh, targets uh, and uh, transports effectively uh, tumstat into the target site and improves the cell uptake. So it's effective at very low concentrations. Once again, as I mentioned before, there are about 50% of the patients uh, who struggle with this disease are non-responders to current therapies. So there's a significant underserved population. And current uh, products, you know, currently the global market is around $10 billion and it's growing rapidly. So in this slide, you know, um, there is a high-level data. We have a lot of strong preclinical data on this program. So here, uh, demonstrating head-to-head -head with ILEA and uh, Avastin, other anti-VEGF therapies which are being used in the market. ILEA currently is a gold standard. If you look into the left side of the uh, slide, this is oxygen-induced retinopathy model. It's uh, compared to ILEA. Again, our 10 microgram dose of RT200 compared to double the dose of ILEA, which is 20 micrograms, shows a you know similar effect, which is very effective in controlling in a DME relevant model. And again, in the center, RQ200 is compared to Avastin, another anti-VEGF product, and uh, showing in a CNV model, uh, which represents a wet macular degeneration, and uh, showing statistical superiority to Avastin in controlling the lesions in this model. Again, on the right side, another um, laser-induced model, CNV model. Um, here, you're showing ILEA, RQ200, and the combination. Obviously, the combination is more effective than individual therapies in this, which, which looks very promising. Once again, I know um, this is very exciting data. We're working very hard. And last year, we announced a CDMO partnership for manufacturing this product, and this program is really moving well. And uh, we are again, uh, we, we reached a, a good agreement with FDA on the plan for, you know, IND enabling studies. Currently, we're executing those. And we are hopeful to take this program uh, into the clinic and phase one to clinical trials in the first half of next year. So now coming down to um, the mechanism of action and uh, comparing to other therapies in the marketplace, as I mentioned before, uh, the current anti-VGF therapies are good in controlling uh, VGF level. Um, you know, when there's a leakage, immediately control and, uh, and then make it dry and it controls the disease. Um, however, um, our product also targets only active endothelial cells, activates native androgenic process. That means it has potential to control um, any additional formation of those blood vessels, which are unwanted. And uh, also with the transferrin, it has ability to enhance, uh, you know, cell uptake and, and, and uh, be effective at very low concentration as I showed it before, a 10 microgram dose. And uh, it also has a multiple feature, so pro apoptotic antioxidants, which could be really beneficial because of the integrin targeting and also being a fusion protein macromolecule, we believe uh, the durability could last longer because it's very really important, you know, these patients get multiple injections in the eye, intravitreal space. Not only you want it to be effective, if you can reduce the number of injections per year uh, to four or less, it could be very effective for this population. Once again, you know, there are other anti-integrin programs uh, which are with the smaller molecules, not macromolecules like we have. They are proven 
this therapy is effective in DMA patients. Now, in a nutshell, coming to close out, um, uh, we have, as I mentioned, working extremely hard with Covaxin this year. Our goal is to use, utilize all the data we generated in India, in a large population, you know, about 30,000 patients, phase one, phase two, phase three. And also they have started mass immunization and develop a regulatory path by working with FDA and bring this product to US market and launch it and to save many lives in the US. In addition to that, our RQ400, as I mentioned, will be in the clinic this year and we'll start getting some safety and efficacy signals next year. Similarly, 200 and 410 will be in the clinic uh, by next year that will generate significant near-term and um, mid-term milestones. So closing out, as a company, you know, we're very excited about modified gene therapy platform um, with the one product has the ability to treat many, many inheteroretinal diseases. RQ200 is a novel biologic targeting to potentially to treat many retinal diseases which have a significant underserved population, about 50% of non-responders to current therapies. And uh, we are going to generate many near and midterm milestones uh, with the uh, initiation of four phase one, two trials with our gene therapy and biological program. And uh, we are working extremely hard to bring in this um, Covaxin, which is looking very promising product, which is already going through mass immunizations in India to US market to save lives this year. Thank you. Shankar, thank you so much for your presentation. It's a pleasure having you here. We received many questions, and as you can imagine, majority of the questions are about the coaxin. Uh, so I'll just try to uh, organize the questions. So number one question we receive is regarding the agreement with Bharat Biotech. So uh, when you will have the tech transfer and how, what is the agreement, would you disclose the deal terms? Good question, Ahu. So once again, we had a binding LOI uh, with the key business terms locked in. And uh, we are working extremely hard to get the definitive agreement in place. And uh, I mean, that has elements of, uh, you know, um, uh, the business terms as well, including some initial supply and, the, and then before we could take transfer to US market so that you know the doses are available. Again, as soon as uh, um, it's, it's uh, coming, um, um, very shortly we're going to announce uh, the closure of the definite agreement and uh, we'll provide details to the market. Stay tuned. That sounds good, Shankar. Another question we receive is regarding if you would be able to use the clinical trials from India or do you have to conduct additional US trials? a great question. Once again, uh, you know, um, these are extraordinary circumstances and unprecedented times. So that's why if you look at the regulatory agencies uh, across the board, including US, EU, and elsewhere, India, China, everywhere, I think what they're considering is, you know, everybody is going through the clinical trials as we speak. So we have two emergency use authorizations in the US. These are not BLAs. These are emergency use authorizations. Uh, because of the pandemic. Therefore, we believe the data they're generating in India is very strong and uh, they have very good safety and significant and strong immunogenicity data from phase one and phase two clinical trials. So what we are planning to do is they have completed enrollment. They're anticipating to get the efficacy data in the next few weeks. And also they started mass immunization. So our goal is to pull in all this data together and uh, continue to work with FDA and uh, come up with a plan. I mean, how fast, you know, can we bring this product to the U.S. market um, under emergency use authorization so that, you know, we can contribute to saving lives and fight against COVID. So we are going to utilize as much data as possible coming out of India, a large data set, and then work with agency and see how rapidly we can deploy this vaccine in the U.S. market. That's our goal. Again, if you have to do any additional studies, we'll be happy to do that. And that brings me to my next question on the efficacy front. So you actually do not have the information how it compares to Pfizer and Moderna's uh, vaccines. So you, we will have that information after you gather uh, Indian clinical trial information, as I understand. Yeah, that's uh, accurate, uh, Ahu. Yeah. 
I mean, as you know, um, the vaccines have you know multiple things, right? One is safety, which is very important, covering the large patient population and demographics, you know, children, elderly, high-risk groups. And the second thing is immunogenicity, uh, which is a humoral and the cellular responses, and uh, which are very important for the memory and long-term durability. And the third one is efficacy. Obviously, um, they have uh, significant data on the FOS2. The efficacy uh, is based on, uh, just like how Pfizer and Moderna did, you need to have certain hit rates and you have to have certain infectivity rates. And once they reach that interim analysis, they'll be able to provide the efficacy. So currently, we are waiting for that. That makes sense, Shankar. So also, is there a nasal spray or an injection is one part of the question. And the second part is, so does that mean you could actually uh, perhaps be used with the other vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, that could be a second addition to the vaccination? And also, I guess the dosing schedule in that sense would be important. Is it one time shot? Like what is the dosing sch schedule would look like? Yeah, great question. Um, once again, uh, you know, uh, I just want, this is a, a standard uh, vaccine um, intramuscular injection. Um, it's a given uh, uh, two doses, um, one uh, initial dose and the booster at 28 days. And, uh, and that, that, again, has shown significant, uh, you know, it elicited significant immune response uh, once you give after 28 days. Uh, both humoral uh, responses against multiple antigens as well as cellular responses, Th1 response. Once again, uh, the nasal vaccine Bharat is working on in India is a separate product, and uh, they're trying to initiate early stage clinical trials. What we have is a whole inactivated, um, you know, whole virus inactivated vaccine, which are bringing it to US. There are reasons for that is, uh, again, you get a protection against multiple antigen. In addition to spike, you also have a protection against nucleocapsid protein too, which is very important. You know, if there is a significant viral escape and mutations in the future, and this could be still effective. Number two, you had a very, very valid question. Um, uh, you know, what do you do if people get the other vaccines and then how can this vaccine also can be used in the future? Again, those are the discussions with our esteemed scientific advisory board we are having. You know, once we have authorization in the US, obviously we'll be conducting some um, phase four studies in other vaccine populations. You know, there are a lot of unanswered questions, right? I mean, uh, can, can, you, can somebody who took the, you know, a spike protein-based vaccines, or um, can, they, can they get a broader vaccine in the future as a booster um, so that, you know, they're covered uh, from safety as well as efficacy perspective or immunogenicity? So I think we're going to, again, evaluate those things. Our goal is to, uh, you know, generate as much data as possible in the future so that this vaccine could be very effective in our toolkit in the US, which we believe is much needed. Thanks for that clarification, Shankar. I want to ask one last question regarding the corona program. I would like to uh, move to other programs or more general questions after that. Majority of the questions we received from the audience was on this program. As I understand, you cannot disclose the timeline exactly, but I, I guess, when would you have the FDA meeting? Do you have a timeline in mind? And perhaps just uh, on the corporate strategy point of view, when do you think you might receive an F, uh, FDA approval? Do you have any timeline in your mind? That's, a, that's a, again, a loaded question. I'll try my best. I mean, my team and uh, you know, our external uh, advisory and uh, scientific advisory, they're all working extremely hard because this is so important, you know. So uh, currently we're in discussions again, and so um, I, I cannot uh, give a very specific timeline. Our goal is to, again, um, their efficacy data um, is going to come out, um, you know, in a few weeks. As soon as that comes out uh, in uh, a first quarter, obviously that will complete, you know, our package, whatever we need to discuss, you know, very clearly with the FDA and what the next steps are. And again, we believe the strong data will help us in the unprecedented times and see if we have ability to move the program very quickly into EUA stage and so we can quickly deploy it. So I, I, I think we're working very hard. Again, uh, we need to get the efficacy data from India, which is, which is targeted in the next few weeks in the first quarter, not too long. You know, uh, so we don't have to wait for too long for that. As soon as it comes out, um, our, our strategy is going to be um, pretty clear.
what we are doing in the US and what else is needed before we get the EUA. Thanks, Shankar. Uh, so I would like to ask you about uh, what happened with the shareholder meetings last week. I think you had a lot of reaction on the stock. I just want to clarify that for the audience. So what happened? What was the reason for the cancellation? Does it mean anything? The stock rebound, but still I think it's important to clarify for the investors. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, once again, you know, um, um, after we went public last year and again, we have um, limited uh, authorized shares. I just want to clarify the you know, investors out there uh, for the clarification. Uh, it's pretty um, uh, common and nominal for any um, biotech gro- growth companies. Um, whenever you know, there are shares which they are running out, any growth company has to continue to raise funds, right? I mean, it's to move their programs and that's where you're creating a value for the shareholders while you're taking care of the patients. So as a process, you know, when, when you are running out of authorized shares, if you're getting limited amount, so for the future rises, you know, you're going to rise X amount of shares. It doesn't mean you're going to make a significant offering using all those shares. I just want to clarify. So we wanted to, um, you know, increase our authorized shares so that they're there for the future, any, any fundraising efforts which are needed. And that's the reason. So the, the, it, the, uh, entry of the vaccine into our pipeline. And uh, we thought, you know, uh, we can take a step back and, and see, you know, how this whole strategy fits in with the organization, including looking into, you know, any potential uh, non dilutive funding sources because of the vaccine. So we wanted to take our time and uh, before we go back to shareholders, you know, um, to increase authorized shares. So that's the reason actually we, uh, we canceled the meeting. We wanted to take our time look at the overall strategy of the company where we are and uh, which is different compared to, you know, two months ago. So that's why we, we just wanted to carefully evaluate everything. And again, I wanted to, um, you know, give this message to the shareholders and investors out there. When the companies increase number of authorized shares, it doesn't mean they come up with a major offering to use all the shares. You know, all the companies have the authorized shares and, uh, um, you know, for them to grow as an organization and create value for the shareholders. That's helpful, Shankar. So I don't want other programs to go missing with the coronavirus being the main focus. I just would like to, I guess, get your perspective on the, what, how do you differentiate from other companies in the space, considering you are going really after large market potential ophthalmology with strong unmet needs uh, disease landscapes. and Second part of my question would be, how do you think you are valued compared to the uh, competitors in the field? Okay, yeah, sure. I'll, get, I'll, I'll answer that. The first question, I mean, that's a very valid question. Um, the co-vaccine um, is, a, is, a, is a major program. And, and so, however, as I mentioned before, um, what we did, there is no impact to our gene therapy program, um, which are very, very close to our heart. And, you know, we really want to take these programs for the benefit of the patients. As I mentioned, there are so many desperate patients um, who are struggling with all these uh, back of the eye retinal diseases. Many of them are, you know, orphan. Currently, there are no approved therapy. So we are working extremely hard. There's no uh, change on the focus on those. As I mentioned before, our manufacturing came out really good uh, from Consino Bio. We, we, we are working on finishing up the preclinical GLP talk studies that are needed for the IND for OCU 400. So that's on track. There is no change to that. What we have done is, uh, so that will be in the clinic as I planned, you know, as we planned in the second half of this year. And the OCU 200 program, the biologic, which we said will be in the clinic in the first half of next year, is moving really well from the manufacturing side as well as other IND enabling studies. So what we have done, we put a, a significant, uh, you know, we in addition to SAB, we brought a lot of external advisors who are ex, you know, Pfizer and Merck vaccine experts, you know, which we have, we have a very strong network, you can see based on our backgrounds. So we brought a significant, a huge external network, and they're all working on the vaccine program. So there's no impact to current oxygen gene therapies in our focus. So it's like a, almost like a two separate groups. Of course, some of our management team members are involved in both. What we are trying to do is not to take the focus off our ophthalmology programs, but bring a significant external team which are working on the co-vaccine. That, that sounds great, Shankar. 
unfortunately we came to an end we have many other questions especially on the coronavirus program so i guess you will have to answer them on a different platform or at another time thank you so much for your time much appreciate your participation to the conference thank you so much uh, thank you for having me on appreciate it bye <laughs>